Bonjour, uh, good morning, buenos dias. Soy Guillermo de los Reyes. Uh, this is the second presentation of the day in room three. And I will be talking about the complexities of Freemasonry in Mexico and also Masonic historiography. When we talk about Freemasonry in Mexico, it is important to talk about the different traditions that Mexico has as a country in, ter in terms of keeping records. We are here at the Grand Orient de France, where a, they are very lucky to have a beautiful library with archives well kept, well organized, and well curated. In Mexico, unfortunately, we didn't have that tradition in the past. Now we do, and sometimes Masonic scholars and other historians have to put together the puzzle, right? We need to travel, for example, for my research that I will present here, I have found documents here in Paris, in this building at the Grand Orient de France that I couldn't find in Mexico during the end of the 19th century. Because in Mexico, as you will see, there was a, a dictator, Porfirio Diaz, who was in love with France, and he wanted to keep connections with France. But that's, I'll talk about later. My talk today, I have three main goals. The first one is to analyze the role of Freemasonry in Mexican history, and also tell you about what was happening in, in Freemasonry in Mexico, particularly in the 19th century. Although, thanks to a document that I got yesterday from a colleague in Mexico uh, who does research about ma 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 Freemasons who were presidents of Mexico, we found out that one of the presidents of Mexico in the 20th century, Carlos Salinas de Gortari, from 1988 to 1994, who in my book, Herencias Secretas, I, that I published in 2009, I claimed that he was not a Freemason because I did not have any evidence. But last night, I got a message from Wenceslao giving me information and also some documents that I will show you here that he was indeed a Mason. The next goal is to emphasize the importance of using archival sources to reconstruct Masonic history. As uh, this is a conference on the history of Freemasonry, it is important to back up our findings. And also highlight the needs, and this is for um, an audience because this is actually being recorded to be preserved for other scholars in other parts of the world to invite both Masons, non-Masons, historians, non-historians, the importance of keeping records, the importance to keeping an archive and try to make it available to the public because we have many private archives, but we sometimes don't have access. So, first of all, the key points. In Mexico, the Masonic lodges in the early 1800s were the first forms of political associations. They became what they were, what we now call political parties. And they, the, the names were Yorkinos, the York right, and Escoceses, the Scottish right, as we are surrounded by great sim, sim, symbolic things here from the Scottish right. In, I mean, the, the Masonic symbols, I'm sorry. <laughs> Masonic symbols. Um, we were yesterday, in fact, at a, at a, at a Scottish Rite uh, temple. That is why my almost confusion, but. Uh, inside the Masonic Lodges, political ideas were created to give rise, and Freemasonry in Mexico, although Mexico is not the exception, as we uh, heard before, the secularization and laicism in other parts of the world, such as France and Turkey, was um, important. And they, the Freemasons in Mexico, from the Masonic lodges, regardless of the right, 
It could be the York right, Scottish right, or Mexican national right, el rito nacional mexicano. They promoted ideas of laicism and secularization, despite the, despite the fact that Mexico was and still is a Catholic country. The framework to study Freemasonry in Mexico that I proposed, this is not, an, and I include some years, but it's important to know that these are not stages or phases of Freemasonry. This is more a framework, a methodology to study historical, a historical period based on, on my findings. Other scholars can use it or not, but I don't want to be confused with stages of Freemasonry because I don't like to see study history on, 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 uh, in that regard. I'm more from the ha uh, Jürgen Habermas perspective of history. Of history. First of all, the, for the formative years and persecution, uh, which I claim that is from 1790, the end of the, of the 1700s, until before the independence in 1820. And in this period, we have the Inquisition looking around, trying to find Freemasons, as I will discuss in more depth later today. Then the political uh, prominence of Freemasonry, secularization, and anti-clericalism. There was a big rivalry between the church, the institution of the Catholic Church, and the different Masonic lodges, as it was in fact a war, the so-called the War of Reforma, between the church and the state, and the state was represented by many Masonic lodges. Uh, its lodges uh, became political parties, as I mentioned before, and many of them were involved in the War of Reforma that was fighting for the secularization of the country, and we have here the Yorkinos and the Escoceses. Then we have the period of the, what I call the reign of Porfirio Díaz or the Porfiriato. Porfirio Díaz was a dictator from 1876 till 1911. Uh, the Mexican Revolution started in 1910, but Porfirio Díaz decided, he was actually not overturned by the Mexican Revolution, he decided that Mexico was ready to be governed by itself or themselves, by, and he decided to come to Paris to be in the exile. And he was a Mason who got all his degrees in one day, uh, the Scottish Rite degrees, up to the 33rd degree, and he created something that is called, that was called La Gran Dieta Simbolica, or the Great Diet, to unify Freemasonry in Mexico. A very uh, interesting situation that reflects the way in, in which he governs Mexi governed Mexico, because he created this so-called Pax Porfiriana, as the historians call it, in which Mexico, that was a country with a lot of wars and all that, became peaceful, although with a very hard political hand, and also with, a, with uh, co controlling everything, the Catholic Church, the Masonic lodges, with different uh, controlling all the political and, and economic scene by one, by the, by the, by the dictator. Then we have the post-revolutionary uh, post period and the decline and transformation of Freemasonry that um, I will not discuss in depth before, with the exception of the situation with, uh, with Carlos Salinas de Gortari, as I mentioned earlier. The, during the origins of Mexico, and here is my uh, first hypothesis that I have, is that at the end of the 18th century, there were Possibly, we don't have enough evidence to claim that there were Masonic lodges at the end of the 1700s. We don't have any evidence of any char uh, charts from neither uh, any European country or the United States. However, we do have evidence that Freemasonry was present in Mexico, as, um, as, as has happened in other countries, for example, um, here in France, there was presence of Freemasons before Freemasonry 
in the, was institutionalized in, in, in France. The same happened in Mexico. Um, what is the evidence that we have? The Inquisition records. The first one, the first Inquisition trial was in 1785. Manuel Sur Surals, uh, a Mexican, um, as Mexican, and then we have a Frenchman and an Italian who were tried because they wanted to become Masons, and, and here we have people from, from Italy and, 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 and France and Mexico, so we are represented here like back in, in, in 1785. Then from 1793 to 1794, we have Pedro Burdals and Juan Lausel, who were two Frenchmen. These are the names that appear in the Inquisition records. Perhaps they were Hispanicized, but these are the names Pedro Burdales and Juan Lausel. And they were Frenchmen, according to the Inquisition records. And then in 1817, we have Fray Servando Teresa de Mier and Roman Cardeña. I will talk a little bit about Fray Servando Teresa de Mier, who was a friar, who was a Catholic, a very liberal Catholic, who was apparently, um, they claim that he was a Freemason because he wrote two very, very important documents in which he was talking about freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of ex uh, expression, as I mentioned before, and he always defended the ideas of the Freemasons. We don't have any evidence that he was a, a Freemason. For, to the Inquisition, he was a Freemason. He, we know that he was a member of the, of the order of Caballeros Racionales, the Rational Knights, but we don't know that he was a Freemason. But his political thought was paramount for many of the Freemasons. And what I claim in, in a, a work that I'm doing right now is that the Mexican Enlightenment took place in the early 19th century with the ideas of, of Fray Servando Teresa de Mier and also we have another, another character that I talk in, in another work that is uh, Fernández de Lizardi who wrote several documents defending the Freemasons. And we know that he was not a Freemason. Although we see, and that is why it is important, in Mexico we, we, we don't talk much about the Enlightenment as a movement. We, we look at Europe as, as, as the place where the Enlightenment uh, happened. And of course the origins were right at this, in this, the epicenter was in this country. However, many of the ideas were brought and discussed in the Masonic lodges. It is important also to mention that the Catholic Church saw that there were many people questioning some of their ideas and, and with different ideas. And of course here we, we can see that to some uh, people, God was no longer the center of their, the, the ideals. It was men in that in back in the, in the days, now it's humanity. And it is important to see that the ideas that were brought in the Masonic lodges also became part of the Mexican political thought, even if they were not Masons. One important aspect to think and now is the question, and when was the first lodge, official lodge form in Mexico? Talking about Mexican historiography, we have and for many years, we have, okay, let me point to here. Okay. For many years in Mexico, we had two publications in which all Masonic historians and all historians who were not Masons talked about the first Masonic Lodge in Mexico. A, a lodge that was founded in 1806, according to Jose Maria Mateos in his Masonería in, Historia de la Masonería in Mexico, the history of Freemasonry in Mexico, and he claims that there was a lodge in the street of, in the street of, in Ratas Street, or, or Rue de Ratas, although he never shows, and he never gives any information about 
the, the charter that founded the lodge. We don't have the so-called carta patente. But many people so sort of like preserve that myth, that idea. We have another one. This is a Mexican uh, Masonic historian. And in this document, he officially claimed that Freemasonry starts in 1806. And he mentions people in that meeting, Gregorio Martinez, Feliciano Vargas, Miguel Dominguez. These characters were important characters because they were members of the revolts, the insurgents, particularly Miguel Dominguez, who was El Corregidor de Querétaro, or the, the mayor of, of Querétaro, a city and a region in Mexico. But we don't have the charter, neither from, from the Louisiana, that was the first charter of, of, in the Logia Unida Mexicana in Veracruz. Here the ports uh, are very important for Mexico. We have another history of Mexican Freemasonry by the North the, the North American author and Mason, Richard Chisholm, and he mentions that the first lodge belonged to the York Wright, and it was, and also he mentions that there were other four lodges established in Mexico that came from Spain, from Gibraltar and Cadiz. Of course, uh, Cadiz, as, as those familiar with the Spanish Freemasonry, Cadiz was a very liberal center in, in Spain and Europe in general. And also it claims that there were thousands of Masons in Cadiz. We don't have, I mean, as, as Professor Jose Antonio Ferrer Benimeli has claimed, there was, there was a liberal town, there were Masonic lodges, but there, there were not thousands, as they were saying. We don't have evidence to claim that. And Chisholm, in Mexican historiography, Chisholm, Richard Chisholm, and Jose Maria Mateos for many years dominated the idea that the first lodge was in 1806. And they both claimed that there was not Freemasonry before. So my hypothesis here is, one, there were Masons in Mexico before 1806. However, we need to be careful to claim that the first lodge was established in 1806 because we have no evidence of that. Also, as a scholar, I decided that to talk about, Meso the, or the, the, to give a year of Masonic history might be relevant. However, it is more relevant to look at the different nouns, different things that happen around Masonic Freemasonry in that year. Another uh, mes uh, Mason, Luis Salce y Rodriguez, claimed that Freemasonry started in Mexico during the, came to Mexico during the Inquisition. So uh, I agree with Salce's claim. But it is important to look at the different charters and the ones that we have about the first lodge in Mexico was not from 1806 in the Street of Ratas. Was from 1808 in, um, we don't have the, the exact address, but we have the charter and the Logia Unida Mexicana that was claimed there. Another uh, idea that many Ma Masonic scholars claim, and that also is the Freemasonry was the cause of the Mexican independence. We don't have evidence of that. And I, my interest is not to talk about that. My interest is to talk about how much Freemasonry developed right after the Mexican independence. So Mexican independence, between 1810 to 1821, we know that there were meetings, secret meetings, in, in different churches and in other secret places that they could be uh, proto or pre-Masonic lodges. But what interests me the most is the following years, exactly when we have the so-called Yorkist and Scottish, okay, during the New Republic. One important aspect in Mexico is that Mexico 
is a hybrid country. We have a very conservative ideas and we have a founder father among the different founder fathers, Miguel Hidalgo, for example, those who are from Mexico might think that Miguel Hidalgo, as many Masonic scholars have claimed, was a Freemason. He was not a Freemason. There is a discussion that we, among Masonic historians or historians who are not Masons, have already agreed. Although there are people that in this idea of everyone was a Mason during the Mexican independence, they think, but he was not a Mason. However, there were other members of the insurgents, as we call them, los insurgentes, that they were Masons. But what it, it is interesting here is that Agustin de Iturbide, who was one of the key members to fight for the Mexican independence, who signed the Declaration of Independence in Mexico in 1821, became the first emperor of Mexico, Agustin Iturbide I. And uh, Iturbide, who was not a Mason, was extremely careful about the Freemasons, so he had extremely harsh censorship laws of freedom of meeting and freedom of expression. And it was here when, when Jose Joaquin Fernandez de Lizarde created the defense of the Freemasons that I talk in my book. And also because the first Mexican constitution in 1824 declared the Catholic Church of the official church in Mexico. And that was really a situation that many of the Masons did not like. And the Yorkinos and the Escoceses. For, I mean, for in this audience, I don't have to explain uh, about the Yorkinos and the Escoceses. Uh, usually in Mexico, we learned about the first political parties, but we, when we are in, in, in elementary school, we, we don't know that they were Masons. We just thought that it was, uh, when I grew up, I thought it was just a name. And then it was when I, I met my, my professor and mentor, Paul Rich, that I, that I was talking to him about it. And he said, do you know that they were Freemasons? And then is when I became interested about Freemasonry. And the interesting part in Mexico, in the Yorkinos and the Escoceses, is that it's diffi difficult to trace who were, who were Yorkinos and who were Escoceses because they were going from one group to the other. We have in the 1820s, 1821, all the way to the 1840s, people who were members of the Scottish uh, political party going to the Yorkist political party, depending on their political maneuvering. However, the, in, in general terms, in terms of political thought, the Scottish, the Los Escoceses were more on the conservative side and they were the ones who some members of the Spanish army were from the Escoceses or former members of the army. And the Yorkinos were the more liberals and also were the ones that were close to the first US ambassador. I mean, he was not called ambassador, the first US official in Mexico who was Joel R. Poinsett. Joel Poinsett was a Mason initiated in the York Rite, and Joel Poinsett was instrumental for the first York Lodges that came from Mexico. The charters of the first York, uh, York Lodges in Mexico came from Louisiana, uh, New, or New Orleans in particular, and also from Charleston in South Carolina. And they came through the Puerto Veracruz, and there was the Logia Unida Mexicana, and then they founded some of the lodges that we have then in Mexico City. Something very interesting that happened, many, I mean, something that I would like to make clear today is that Joel Poinsett, unlike many of the Mas Masonic historians, so historians who, are, who were Masons who wrote, Joel Poinsett did not bring, did not found the York Rite in Mexico. It was a group of 
Masons who were initiated outside Mexico when they, as we know, the liberals traveled to, to London, uh, to Philadelphia, to New York, to Paris, to Cadiz, and some of them, like, like the great Simon Bolivar, were initiated outside Mexico, and they asked Poinsett to bring, to help them to get the charters from North, uh, South Carolina and from Louisiana. Also something important to mention is that in 1825, because a group of Freemasons believed that Freemasonry was becoming very political in Mexico with the Yorkinos and the Escoceses, they founded in 1825 the Rito Nacional Mexicano. And the Rito Nacional Mexicano um, was at the beginning not supposed to be very political, but it became extremely political. And it was the place where we have the famous Benito Juarez, the Benemérito de las Américas. But going back a little bit before, in 1824 we have the first president of Mexico, Guadalupe Victoria, who was a member of the York Right, who was a member of the Yorkinos. And then after uh, Guadalupe Victoria came Vicente Guerrero, also a member of the Yorkinos. So we know that the liberals, the Yorkinos, were the strong uh, political party. And during this period we have some of the, as I mentioned before, the lodges, Liberty, Independence, Federation, and the Rito Nacional Mexicano in 1825. And these lodges were particularly created because a group of Mexican Masons wanted to establish Freemasonry in Mexico. So if we're going to talk about the, the golden years of Freemasonry in Mexico, we can go from the 1825 up to the 1857. During this time, there was what I call in my book um, Brothers Without Brotherhood, because the, it was a, a war between Masons. There was a war between the York, the Yorkinos and the, and the Escoceses. Las Guerras, yo, the, Los Yorkinos y de los Escoceses, the wars, in which we have that, starting with a, a, a very interesting character, uh, Nicolás Bravo, we have a candidate to be a president and a candidate to be a vice president. We have a tradition for many years in which the vice president created a um, complot, a coup d'etat against the president, and usually they were Masons. They were all Masons. So there was this big brotherhood without, or brothers without brotherhood. It's interesting to see, and it, it even happened all the way to the, the, the first, you know, the, 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 pres the first president in the, in the 20th century after Porfirio Diaz, Francisco I. Madero, who was a, a, a Mason, and Victoriano Huerta also, who, who was another Mason, um, a, organized a coup d'etat and they killed uh, Francisco Madero, the same way that that happens during this time. Nicolás Bravo was president of Mexico from 1842 to 1843. He was leader of the Scottish Rite, supported Emperor Iturbide. He was basically the York Rite, the Yorkinos control, the liberals were in power in Mexico from 1825, 1826 to the 18, early 1840s. And then the Scottish party became more powerful with Nicolás Bravo, who rose up to his brother, President Bustamante, and executing him the same way that, that Nicolás Bravo did it, and the same way that later on it was done by Francisco y Madero. So during this time, there were the, 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 the values and the principles of Freemasonry were not followed within these political parties. So it is important to see for those who are interested in the, in the values of Freemasonry, 
to understand the difference between what happens in the lodge room or what happened there and also how these groups became pure political parties. They were, uh, we need to separate, the, they were called Yorkinos and Escoceses, but it's important to see that the principles, the objectives at the end were different. The Yorkinos were a political party. They were not a Masonic lodge. And the Escoceses were not, I mean, they, they had nothing to do with the right. It, they became political parties. Although they were Masons all over, but it is important to do that because um, the same way that we are very careful to claim that not that the French Revolution was not uh, led by all the Masons or the Mexican independence or the US independence was not led by Masons. It is important to mention that the Yorkinos and the Escoceses were not two Masonic lodges or two Masonic rites at the moment. They, they were named after and inspired from, but they were no longer Masonic groups. It is important to mention that. Um, I, I already mentioned the uh, persecuting of the Masons with the, with the Defensa de los Francmasones, the Triunfo de los Francmasones, the Segunda Defensa de los Francmasones. I will not stop on that because I already mentioned it, but it is important to mention that they were writers. They were uh, prominent intellectuals in Mexico who were not Masons, who wrote in favor of the Masons. Also, uh, here we have some of the, of the different important characters that I mentioned before, Fray Servando and Lizardi. What I call the Masonic Renaissance. Benito Juarez, who we have here with his uh, Masonic uh, apron and attire, he was a, the first indigenous president in Mexico. And he was from the south of Mexico. He was not from Mexico City, he was from Oaxaca. And he is arguably the most respected Mason in Mexico. And uh, Benito Juarez, he was extremely li liberal. He was pivotal in the, uh, pivotal participant for the second Mexican constitution, the second liberal constitution, which is, was in 1857. He was also a leader in the war of reforma. And the war of reforma was the separation between the church and the state. So if we're going to talk about the father of secularization, the father of laicism, we can talk about Benito Juarez. And it is this principle, this moment in Mexico, that if we can, and I, historically I don't like to trace lines, but if there is one ideal that the Masons have kept in terms of of fighting in terms of politics is the separation between church and state in Mexico, and also to become a, 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 a lay country. Laicism is extremely important. The Mexican Constitution in FT57 was supposed to have the Catholic Church and, and the only religion, but they forgot about that detail. So in the Constitution of Mexico of 1857, we already have separation between the church and the state. And in the war of reforma, the church, the clergy in Mexico lost all their properties, all their powers. They were not, they were not flero, uh, fl uh, uh, um, protection, ecclesiastical protection. El fuero ecclesiastico disappeared. And it was, they were extremely violent and and bloody wars in Mexico during this period, and many of the Masons fought in favor of the secularization, led by Benito Juarez. It is important to mention that it was the war between conservatives and liberals, and then we have, for example, uh, in, the, in, the, in the 19th century, we have in Mexico presidents who were there for one year, for six months. Benito Juarez were there longer, and it was then, in 1862, Mexico decided to uh, not pay their debt to some European countries such as the, I mean, uh, the United Kingdom, France, and, and Spain. The United Kingdom and Spain decided to not pursue any, you know, 
punishment to Mexico, but France decided with Napoleon. Uh, the third, and then um, he named Maximilian as the first, I mean, there, there was a war between the, the French-Mexican War, uh, the, the so-called Cinco de Mayo, the, <laughs> that in, in, in the United States where I live right now, they believe that for some reason Cinco de Mayo became so big in the United States that they believe that it's the Mexican independence. But it's not the Mexican independence. Independence it was this war between Mexico and France that succeeded. But it was, it's important to mention that this war was supported by the Mexican conservatives. Because the Mexican conservatives asked Napoleon III to bring a French emperor of Mexico, Maximilian I, came to Mexico and, and, and was the emperor of Mexico between six, 1864 to 18. And Maximilian was in the center. Maximilian, interesting, was also a Mason. And this is the the Masonic uh, legends that, that, that I, I don't have any evidence, but it was claimed that at the moment in which the reformistas, that Juarez and his army were actually taking Mexico City and captured Maximiliano de Asburgo, that many of the conservatives and even the liberals asked Juarez to forgive Maximiliano because he was a Mason. And in fact, there is the... The, the folklore of, of, of the lore of Mexican history says that Maximilian was doing some Masonic symbols because he did not want to be executed. But Juarez needed to think as a statement and he, and he killed him. All of this is claim that, that I think is important to, and I do it in a different article that I wrote. Sometimes it is also important to study the folklore of Freemasonry to see what are the things that people believe that happened that did not happen, or that we don't have any evidence to claim. And um, Juarez died, and then this Porfirio Diaz, who was a young liberal, who was part of the, the rebellion of Tuxtepec in Oaxaca, who fought against Maximiliano and all that, he became the Mexican president from 1876 to 1880. And he was not supposed to be a dictator, but there was so, someone in between, Manuel González Aldama from 1880 to 1884, that it was his, his compadre, you know, his friend, and basically there is evidence that Porfirio Díaz was in power during that time. But then in 1884, Porfirio Díaz decided to create this, to become a dictator. And Porfirio Diaz, his Pax Porfiriana, as, an, as I mentioned before, historians call also the, the politics of pan y palo, bread and stick. You know, he was extremely, extremely uh, strong character. He was not the exception in Mexico. We had Rosas in, Ar in Argentina, Getulio Vargas in Brazil. So it's the, the moment in which many of the Mexico has a strong hands, I mean, in Latin America. And Porfirio Diaz left. He was 33 years in power. But he was a Mason, and historically, for us who, uh, who study Freemasonry, Porfirio Diaz created this confederación called the Gran Dieta Mexicana, in which he created peace among the Masons. The Yorkinos and the Escoceses no longer fought. The war ended. The war, I mean, the war ended. Mexico had this Pax Porfiriana. And at the end, we had this character who made peace between the Scottish right, the York right, and the Rito Nacional Mexicano, all the way until the Mexican independence. Then Porfirio Diaz left power, and we have Francisco I. Madero, another Mason. He was not a 33rd degree Mason. He was a 18th degree Mason, according to the, to the Masonic documents that we have. And all the presidents of Mexico that I mentioned today, 
we have proved that they were Freemasons. Um, other Masonic scholars, that is why we're talking about historiography, claim that all Mexican presidents were Masons, which is not true. And in fact, when I was in Alexander, Virginia, at the, at the George Washington Masonic Temple, we had a conference there several years ago. I, we took a tour around the building, a very interesting building. And when we arrived to the, what they call the President's Room, they have pictures, uh, paintings of many presidents around the world. And then they have Juarez, of course. They had Francisco I. Madero. They had a president of the 20th century Mexico, Miguel Aleman. And then the tour guide, uh, um, a mason from, the, from that uh, lodge, told the Mexican constitution says that in order to be <laughs> a president of Mexico, you need to be a mason. And it's not true. So there is the idea, there is the discourse that all Mexican presidents were Masons. And in fact, it is also has been published that, and many people tell you that, and sometimes when you go and give a talk to certain audiences, you need to tell them, no, 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 this is not true. We cannot talk about this. We cannot claim this because we don't have evidence. In the case of Madero, we do. And also in the case of Victoriano Huerta, the following president who assassinated Madero, in what is called the, the 12 Days of tra tra Tragedy uh, in 1913. And Francisco I. Madero was very important because he was able to fight for the, to, to avoid the re-election in the Mexican presidency. So since this period, Mexican presidents cannot be re-elected. In the past, re-election created a conflict. Um, and also, the Constitution of 1917 is the second constitution that reaffirmed the secularization of Mexico. However, this constitution did not create peace. Because in the 1920s, basically 100 years later, we have another war between the church and the states. The priests and the nuns wanted to fight again for the getting the properties back, the churches back. And it was a period from the 19, from 1920s, 1924, 1930, with President Pluta uh, Obregón, who was a Mason, President Calles, who was a Mason, who did a second desamortización, de de second uh, conf confiscation of the churches, and many of the properties that the church was able to keep were taken and became Masonic temples. They were given to the Masons. That is why, in, for example, in Puebla, if you go to Puebla, Mexico, a beautiful colonial town in Mexico, if you go to 3rd Street, you will go to the, the one of the prominent Masonic temples from the Gran Logia de Puebla, and you, say, you will see where the, the, there was a former Catholic church. In fact, when I was a student in, in Puebla in the late 90s, there was during this period the, the so-called Cristero rebellion, La Guerra Cristera. There, there was the, the motto, the phrase, Viva Cristo Rey, that many of the priests and the nuns and the people who fought in favor of this, they were screaming when they were like, you see, I mean, uh, they were about to be killed. Or, and many of the Masonic temples during the 90s also had the graffiti, Viva Cristo Rey. So basically between the 1920s, again, Freemasonry became prominent in Mexico. And it's sort of like the reaffirmation of Freemasonry is going to fight for laicism, and secularization of Mexico. Lázaro Cárdenas, who was another Mexi uh, Mason president in the, in the 40s, was pivotal to end this continue, con I mean, this continuum with wars between the church and the state. And he created this 
another piece on what happened with Lázaro Cárdenas, who was um, a president who nationalized the Mexican oil company, who nationalized the electric company in Mexico. He also did something similar to what Porfirio Díaz did, so like create this unity among Freemasons. And he was so popular among the Masons that he created some lodges that they were named after him when he was alive. In fact, some historians claim that there was a new Masonic rite in Mexico, El Rito Cardenista, which is not true. But there were so many lodges, and what Lázaro Cárdenas tried to do, he wanted the people from uh, the countryside, he opened Masonic lodges in the countryside, in the small towns. They were not successful, um, but that is why they were thinking that it was a Cardenista right. Finally, um, what, what is important to, just to conclude, according to my research, from Cardenas, who was president all the way to the 1940s, it was a tradition for the Mexican presidents to go to the Gran Logia Valle de Mexico, that is in Mexico City. Uh, the governors in different states, the workers, some colleagues, Marco Antonio Ro uh, Garcia Robles, Marco Antonio Flores Zavala, have also shown that in the states of Zacatecas, Aguascalientes, and other colleagues in the states of Oaxaca, and as I, uh, I'm, I'm studying Tamaulipas, another state, also the governors, there was a tradition from Cárdenas, so like he created a tradition, all the way to the 90s, what I claim 1994, we thought that some of the presidents stopped being Masons in 1994. And it was a tradition, but it was more as a symbolic tradition. So uh, the Catholic Church lost power in Mexico in terms of political power since the 18th century, but the Catholic Church had a different presence in Mexico. It was a gender, a gender situation. Women will go to church and men will go to the lodge. All the way, it was sort of like a, 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 a de facto practice in Mexico that then became, in Mexico, uh, many lodges have women Freemasons, unlike the, the United States and, and England, you know, the Anglo tradition. The more Latin tradition, uh, welcome that, but something that, um, and sort of like, this is an agenda for further research. As I was mentioned before when I was talking with some colleague, colleagues earlier, we claimed that some of the Mexican presidents who were the so-called neoliberal presidents, such as Miguel de la Madrid, who was a president uh, before Carlos Inés de Gortari from uh, uh, 1982, to 1987, and Carlos Serinas de Gortari, who was the president who brought NAFTA in Mexico, we claimed that they were no longer interested in Freemasonry. However, we didn't think that they grew up and they were starting their political careers during the period in which Freemasonry was still a, a figure, a powerful figure in the political in the political arena. So a colleague of mine sent me, oh, it's, it's, it's too bad that you cannot see it later, but I will show it to you, and I hope that in the PowerPoint in the video can be seen. Here we have the application letter, or the la carta, the, the, the solicitud to be a Freemason by Carlos Salinas de Gortari who was a president of Mexico from 1988 to 1994. Something very interesting, that probably here in France uh, is not something that you would say, okay, that's normal, but in the United States, where I live, where I, where I, do, I do most of my research, they ask, do you believe in God? And the answer, no. I believe in men as the center of the universe. Why? The, the Masonic National Rite, perhaps when it was founded in 1824, 
wanted to, to, to fight for secularization and probably they were between these liberal ideas. But it was during the Cardenas period in the 1940s, and, and I mean a little bit before during the, the Cristero War, uh, I correct myself, to the 19, late 1920s, in which the Rito Nacional Mexicano, instead of uh, uh, making a promise or like a, uh, El Juramento in front of the Bible or any other religious book, they use the Mexican Constitution. And uh, this anti-clericalism, atheism in Mexico continue and evolved during the Cardenas regime and all the way to the, this is from 1966. So as I, I wrote my book, my book was published in 2009. Of course, I, I did my research in the Guillermo of, 22 years ago, was, as a, was thinking about the, 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 current, the, the political ideas of Salinas de Gortari, neoliberal, Harvard, uh, Harvard um, government school, you know, these ideas of Mexico, you know, we don't need Freemasonry to be part of this. But the Salinas of this period became a Mason. And here you can see the second, the third to last, the columna de, aprendiz, de aprendices, the, the column of apprentices in this book from the Gran Logia del Valle de Mexico, his name is there. So he, was not, he did not only, I mean, ask to be a Mason, he was accepted and initiated. So this is, I wanted to close with this because it is the puzzle that we need to put together. And as historians, as scholars, we need to correct ourselves when it's necessary. And I would like to thank Wenceslao for sending me yesterday this document. And now I need to do the same about the previous president, Miguel de la Madrid, who I also could not find any evidence. But also, now I need to justify myself. When you go to the Masonic archives, Sometimes they, they, when they don't let you see everything. So, so that is why I ask to those who have private archives, who those who are curators of Masonic archives, please let historians use the archives. Because that way we can reconstruct the history of Freemasonry in Mexico, or in Turkey, or in France, or in Italy. And that way we can all work together to answer some of the questions that we have. And merci beaucoup. Thank you.